Hello everyone and welcome back to the Brightworks in another match of Beyond All Reason where today we are taking a look at a match that was recently played by some top-notch players on Forge. Forge a lava-bitten wasteland full of AA battery crystals and tons and tons of metal out on the low end. It's going to be an exciting match to see some of these pro-level top-notch players bashing heads. And today spawning is the 63 open skill Cortex Hero that's going to be our blue team leader for today none other than Zhao. Zhao, indeed, from the Hello Clan, going to be representing the blue team here. 63 open skill, my goodness. Back in my day, back in my day, it didn't even get that high. Uh, I think the highest open skill was 40. Yeah, man, how the times have changed, and the open skill has really gone up. I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to have to change to a completely different system eventually here as the open skill values continue to inflate upwards and upwards. Some sort of ladder system, probably, but maybe after matchmaking is done. Anyway, over on the other side of the map, spawning is the red team leader, also in the Hello Clan. So going up against his teammate here, it's going to be none other than Nazah. So Nazah, also a Cortex commander and also spawning on the front line, basically in the mirrored position against his blue team leader. Yeah, his blue uh, open skill senior right here. But I will say, Nazah definitely has more hours logged, at least according to the chevrons here. So it's an interesting mix, right? We have 36 open skill going up against 63, but we have silver chevrons going up against bronze. It's a battle of experience versus a battle of skill, and I guess we're going to see exactly how these commanders deal with that difference right here. Nizah opting to go for a little bit of reclaim right here, and I'm surprised to see we don't already have those geothermals queued up. Most of the top-notch players already rush out the geos, or at the very least try to rush out those geos as quickly as possible. You can see Nizah trying to stabilize that energy economy as much as possible, trying to build enough energy production that he can actually go into those geothermals. We do have a little bit of aggression across the map here as well as Jeff007, the yellow commander, has managed to sneak a couple of those grunts into the backline here of Mr. Coconut. Deflected nicely by the commander will mean that those ticks don't find any value here, but at the very least they do scout the base, which does mean, oh, they find the metal extractor. Metal extractor is exposed. Boom goes the Metal Extractor, the sole economic driver right here for the Seafoam Green economy. Obviously going to be easy to rebuild right now for Mr. Coconut, but that is such a pain, having to lose that Metal Extractor and rebuild it on the early game. That's your entire economy, so losing it definitely stings ever so slightly. Build power coming up already in the main base here for the Red Commander. We do have a little bit of a pawn harassment trying to take down this Constructor. It will be shut down nicely, though. Unfortunately for the Resbot, no such luxury of defense will mean that the pawn snags a kill. Getting into the back line here. Oh, going to try and get a wind turbine. It does manage to get a wind turbine. Not bad. Definitely finding its value there. The pawn. Have to uh, have to kill a couple structures to make it worth your weight in metal to kill the... Uh, or to, to send a pawn across, right? 48 metal compared to the grunts, 36. Means the pawns have to do slightly more damage than the grunts do in order to make their efficiencies worth. Big old grunt battles all over the place here. Incisor's rolling down from the high ground here for the orange commander. That's going to be a polygon trying to send some of those light incisor uh, laser tanks forward here. A couple of rascals lining up against the grunts over here and the continued aggression over on the right-hand side. Clickety, the green commander here, going for a very aggressive expand here. Yeah, so sending the commander very far forward, but on the southern lane instead of this northern one. And it's leaving Huck in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, suddenly the purple commander... Left in a two versus one situation. This could be a very dire situation indeed. Huck desperately needs to get that commander out to the front because there's nothing else really that's going to be strong enough to hold this 2v1, especially without these metal extractors in the back line being claimed. This does mean, however, that the red player is going to be denied a little bit of economy here. Four metal per second not going back to the red economy, and certainly you can see Clickety actually setting it up and grabbing that economy for themselves. Zhao now stepping forward and going straight into production of those aggravators and skipping the grunt phase entirely. Interesting choice right there. It does mean that you don't have to spend that energy up front. It means you can dump it into geothermals just like this. You can see one of those geos already up and running for the blue commander. Going to go into a e-storage and then some e-converters and then into the second geothermal. Always a good idea to get those geos up as quickly as possible. Remember that is 300 energy per second, which is absurdly efficient for the early game. Push him out, cries the green commander, Admos, trying to get Mr. Coconut to step forward here. Setting up the LLTs, but frankly speaking, it's going to be a little too slow on those LLTs. HLTs now coming up here. The Warden Area Control Lasers now set up for mini goal, trying to deny this area to any of these bots moving forward. A huge amount of bots, by the way. Usually we see mass vehicles in this map, but apparently uh, everybody and their mother feeling very, very generous about those bots. I guess it's not to say, not safe to say, or fair to say that we have a huge number of bots we we usually see bots to deal with all these these crystals around you can reclaim all of them and that gives you a lot of value 
But certainly, uh, vehicles make a lot of sense on these tight, choke pointy maps so that you can out overwhelm the static defenses here. There you go. You can see Zhao transitioning into vehicles on the front line, gonna start pumping out some of those tanks, and uh, more importantly, some of those Wolverines, the light mobile artillery. Perfect for dealing with any of the static defenses that might be set up over here. Aggravators to hold the line while we spend all that metal on that vehicle fabric fabricator will mean that the front line is pushed in quite nicely. This lead now handed off from the green commander is going to move up north and the blue commander can step in to try and keep this line progressing. What a lovely slab of teamwork right here. Not sure why I chose that word specifically. That was just uh, the one that came to mind anyways. Uh, <laughs> what a beautiful set of teamwork right here from Zhao and Kligity working together to keep this front line moving and continuing to bump out more and more different types of units, right? Lending a lot of variability to this, to this line. Atmos here in front of the entire army. That HLT is just moments away from completion. There it goes, firing away now. Mini going a little bit of trouble. 8% per blast, it does look like. Going to be sufficient to threaten that commander offline right now. Oof, yeah, 52% down to 45 Commander in a dire way. Shuriken come out at this point to paralyze a bunch of these units. A lovely pull from the Shuriken right there. Won't be enough to save the heavy laser tower, but at the very least will be enough to shut down this run by very nicely. Keeping all of this safe. Ooh, except for the green commander. Beautiful push right there from the rocket bot. Slowly but surely whittling that commander down and leaving a nice lava bitten bed for that commander to rest its wary eyes upon. Tan and Orange Forces holding the line steadily on this northern side. Agitator is up and running as of right now here. Huck going to set that Agitator up and have it start firing away over here into the forces. We also have these Wolverines continuing to shell away, making it very uncomfortable for those Rocketeers to stay still anywhere. If the Aggravator so choose, or pardon me, if the Wolverines so choose, they can continue to step forward here, and it can be very, very annoying to deal with. A couple of Banshee coming out here. Five Banshee, four Banshee. There's the fifth one. Uh, hmm... Not sure I like this. I mean, the Banshee pull, you can sometimes get away with killing a commander with it, but now the Sam Turret is up and running. Sam Turrets are hardened, so they're very difficult to take down with bombing, so they're going to be very tricky to deal with right here. I don't know that there's a wonderful answer for that. I don't think the Banshees are going to cut it. I think you're basically done with the air harassment in the midsection now. Once again, Wolverine's continuing to fire away. It looks like they don't have vision right here. Oh, yeah. Radar Jammer for the Powder Blue Commander, allowing these units to comfortably stay within range of those Wolverine without them being able to detect them. Even getting so much as a kill on one of them. Very annoying to deal with. You can see this very prominent uh, bot into vehicle play is so, so powerful. Geothermal is already up and running in the backline, and indeed Nizah is going into that T2 lab. We should see one coming up and running here for the blue team very shortly. There it is. The Green Commander Admo is going for one of those T2 labs. Going to try and get that up and running. But frankly speaking, the lack of metal on the front line here is devastating. Yeah, we do not have enough in order to actually keep this all safe. Missile truck. Slowly but surely firing away at those shuriken. Tank commander goes down. Uh, pardon me, the orange commander goes down. Little bit of a mason aggravator push. Just enough to be scary here. Sloth 1500 trying to reclaim some of that wreckage, but can't really get their hands on all of it. Such a tricky thing, sidestepping all this, and the tank commander will go down as well. Yeah, it's a dangerous dance trying to figure that out. We have Huck here a little overexposed. I think maybe this is where the Banshees could find value. If they connected with the purple commander on the northern side, there's not so much anti air here. The blue anti air is going to be sufficient to threaten those back on the southern side of that north part. Not so much on the northern side. Well, oh, nice connections from the shell shockers here. Agitator also set up on the front line, slightly blocked by the static defenses. You have to be really careful about this. You can see it wants to fire in this line, but the GLLT is blocking it. You have to be really careful and make sure that you uh, deconstruct those or even self-destruct them if you really have to. Making sure that you're constantly going to uh, try and open up those lines for the artillery to actually fire past. Not bad. Huck denying a lot of that reclaim here. Maybe not confident in the uh, ability to hold all that. T2 bots now rolling out onto the battlefield here. It's what the tank commander has been paying for by losing that front line. T2 bots are now headed out onto the field. We have Sheldon rolling out as well. Do we have T2 for the blue commander? Indeed we do. T2 metal extractors coming up right now. We need to get these advanced, uh, advanced geothermals up and running pretty quickly here as well. Not going to be the end of the world, though. We do have a lot of solar panels to fund everything, so getting these T2 mechs up and running is going to change the economy into that T2 gear. It means we should see an exponential growth ramping up as we speak. More and more vehicles coming out for the Orange Commander, who's claimed all the metal extractors back here, which is fabulous, of course. Make it... Was that lightning right there? Did I... Am I crazy? Did I see a lightning strike? 
Somebody go back and check that in the, uh, re rewind the video and go check if there was lightning right there. I could be going crazy, but I swear I saw a lightning bolt. Been playing a lot of Noita, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm seeing things now. Jeff007 continuing to aggress this lane. That aggravator, uh, agitator, pardon me, has been wonderful for pushing all these forces back. Making it so inconvenient to step forward with the rocket bots. Just, just completely inefficient. We do have the T2 constructor going around building all the T2 metal extractors, which is always nice. I'm going to be slowly upgrading these so that we can dump that metal into a T2 economy rather than just continuing to pump out T1 units. Geothermal's coming up all over the place as well, as always fabulous. Mr. Coconut holding the line, or trying to desperately. Economic benefit for the red team. I guess they just got, yeah, those geothermals up and running quicker. They got those, ooh, yeah, we got those uh, advanced metal extractors up and running a little faster as well. Now the Sheldon are marching forward here. Whoa, res, Resbots move into the lava. Oh, no. Resbots step a little too far forward into the lava, and it means that they go down to the ambient effect of that melted molten rock. That sucks. That sucks to lose your units to that. The, uh, the terrain dangers are definitely something that's a little bit harder to try and figure out how to counter properly. Cerberus pings Maudib, the cyan voice from the stars. Trying to get this geothermal upgraded into a Cerberus cannon. I think that's a great idea. Upgrading these geo geos to Cerberus can be extremely dominating. More and more Sheldon waddling their way out onto the field. Finding value wherever they can against this T1 artillery without really much of a way to counter it. Yeah, the uh, artillery are too slow to keep up with these Sheldon, and any of the T1 bots are going to be a little too slow as well. Not to mention they're not very sturdy. Agitator on the southern or on the northern side here at the very least going to threaten them off of this small patch of the land But of course once we restore this lava pool those Sheldon will be able to move forward once more The big bundle of riot tanks. Oh no Riot tanks in a big ball always hurt my soul That's definitely not the value of the riot tanks spreading them out in a big line and allowing them to engage across a wide Swarmy force is definitely where you get the most value for riot tanks as you can see here the medium tanks more than happy to just blast those down in a small chase Medium tanks balling up quite a bit better than the riot tanks do. It's a slow arbitrary, or a, a slow uh, attrition, a death by attrition here. Man, and despite that wonderful push on the northern side right here from the green commander, suddenly all that ground has been taken back by the, Shar the uh, Sheldon, I almost called them sharpshooters, by the Sheldon, marching their way forward. My goodness. T2 is making their way around all over the place. Anti-nuke has been set up over here. We also have advanced geothermals. Always makes me a little bit wary whenever I see these AGOs. You can see all the flashing red circles is all the area that is within the maximum danger radius. And uh, yeah, that's the entire red base. Wouldn't mind seeing production moved over here, for instance, just so that we can kind of detach it from where these geothermals would actually explode at. Mm, sometimes that can be worth it. Sometimes it's a little too costly and it's, it just uh, doesn't make up for the amount of resources that you, you miss out on or the amount of units and build power and all that that you have to move over I like that we're continuing the skirmishing here but I think it's time to eat up these T1 defenses and go for T2 we do have a rattlesnake coming up here as well as a frontline T2 lap pumping out units uh, Jeff007 spamming out a whole, a whole bunch of uh, fat boys now as well as a rattlesnake I like the rattlesnake a lot of course you can see even just from way back here this rattlesnake can still engage against most of what the army is fighting for for the different blue players over here Mr. Coconut the lavender commander indestructible all the rest of them there's that geo battery fly firing away wherever it can it's the power of the geothermal plasma battery is it's just unbelievably sturdy it does a huge amount of damage and has quite a lot of health. Also doesn't explode nearly as violently as the uh, advanced geothermal, which is something to be aware of. Fat boys rolling out. Battlesnake also finding its value. Medium tanks finding value. Interesting. Medium tanks in the late game, there's there's a certain threshold of production where the medium tanks are so tanky, even as a T1 unit, that they can still find value against T2, especially T2 compositions like the Sheldon. There are certain there are certain moments where the medium tanks can still find a lot of value, and this is certainly one of them. Those tanks find the T2 laboratory over here. If we go after the build power to manage to bring it down, which we won't be able to, 
that push could have been worth it. But unfortunately, not the case right here. It means that we're going to have to rely on the T2 now rolling out of the laboratory to get anything done at all. At the end of the world, of course, these fat boys are quite powerful. Unfortunately, they self-kill their uh, friend friendly units quite often. <laughs> as we've just seen there, the uh, spy bot going down right here as the fat boys accidentally run into it. Nice EMP right there. Means that the fat boys will catch all of those units standing still. But now the geothermal plasma battery is up and running for the green commander, Atmos. Nicely done. AGO is almost up and running right here. A little bit slower on the draw, though. You can see it indeed. Uh, shield generator actually up and running right now for the red player as well. Apparently not willing to get sniped by a long-range plasma cannon here. Trying to get all the way up into T3. And I think it's well worth it. You can see 140 metal production is quite nice. These T2 metal extractors on the 4.0 metal extractors pulling 16 metal per second is wild. This map is so strange because the front line essentially becomes the tech position, right? You win your front and then you go for tech rather than sort of the, the bread and butter, which is essentially if you are in the back line, you're safe enough to go for tech, where the front line skirmishes it out in T1 until they receive a T2 constructor. It's very strange in the way that the pacing works for that, but it does work out quite nicely for some very aggressive games. Fat boy doing wonders to kill these incisors over here, but there are still a few of them sneaking through. Yeah, you have to be very careful about that. Incisors are just fast enough that they can often get by a lot of the T2 and T1 units. Fighters in the air here trying to defend. We do have loads of fighters on the southern side. Is it a, diver is it a diversionary tactic? It doesn't look like it. Uh, I'm not sure what these fighters were sent in for. Hmm. Either way, the hot pink commander pumping up way more fighters than the blue commander who is going into bombers of course so when you're when you're making those bombers when you're making those shuriken when you're making all that stuff uh you you end up of course spending a little bit more metal on the bombers and a little less metal on the fighters nothing unheard of but it is a little bit of a pain looks like a spy bot connected over here yeah that's the only thing that could paralyze these for so long welders jumping on top of everything what a beautiful pull right here from the yellow commander making moves across the map that is what we like to see. That's how you win a game of Bards, by being the aggressor, taking down those defenses before they have a chance to find value. And that's exactly what we've gotten right here. EMP connects with all this as well. Looks like another spy bot goes off. Uh, or was it an EMP missile? It could have been an EMP missile in the back line here. Uh, I don't see it. Yeah, I think it was a spy bot. Fat boy's all paralyzed here. Shuriken working to keep everything paralyzed. We have Fiends and Sheldon and all the rest of it moving forward right now. Everyone and their mother trying to get on top of all this action, trying to shut down this push before it finds any really massive value. Mammoth's coming out in mass right now from the Green Commander, trying to set up a sort of static but mobile front line here. Something they can deal with, some of the heavier units that are guaranteed to be coming out in any minute now. We do have a uh, anti-stealth here, yeah, that confirms probably a spy bot that connected with that if we're a little bit afraid of that. Here we go, though. Vanguard on the high ground. Vanguard recently receiving a buff. Quite a significant one, too. Their range is now 1450, which is massive. It means that they're going to be able to hit things from way off in the distance. There you go. You can see them shelling away at these constructors here from miles and miles away. Karganeth rolling up and over the hillside here. Going to be in charge of trying to kill some of these Vanguard. Also trying to pop any of these Agios that it can find. And indeed, there are a few viable targets. There's one here, and of course, there's the Cerberus Cannon over here, which is always lovely to try and target down. Will the Vanguard be enough? It looks like it sure will. Finds the Agio and gets to work. 1,250 energy per second, right down the drain right here from that red spider bot now crawling its way back up onto the hillside. Karganeth quite a bit cheaper than Vanguard, 2,500 versus 3,300. Means that, of course, we can produce quite a few more of these. They're also an assault bot, so Cortex definitely with a distinct advantage in the T3 late game on this specific map for the fact that their uh, all-terrain units are quite a bit better at brawling. So when they come over this hillside, they have uh, yeah, quite a quite an easy time engaging with a bunch of the forces that are over here. Persecutor cannon up for the blue commander. Looks like we have a scorpion and some persecutors here as well. Everybody essentially on the same tech here on the fronts. Interesting that we see a T3 transition to Armada, though. I didn't expect that out of the Blue Commander, going for T3 instead of... Uh, or going for Armada T3, rather, instead of uh, Cortex T3. It really isn't the end of the world, of course. Armada T3 is very powerful on the ground, especially those Razorbacks can be really, really dangerous. But what a wonderful push on this southern side. While it was obsessing over the Karganeth and the Vanguard, the Tiger Tanks, the humblest of Tiger Tank, have rolled on through and managed to take down the entire base right here. For Shabama Lama Bad. 
Yeah, I like the Karganeth play right up here into the middle of the map here. We do have more than enough metal to continue producing these Karganeth, of course, coming out at 2,500 metal apiece. Very, very efficient for the price you pay for them. Probably one of the most efficient car uh, Cortex pieces that you can put on the battlefield. And those Vanguard trying their very best, but they really don't have the... They're, they're just not built the same. <laughs> they're built for a different kind of battle. Rocket Spiders here doing their very best as well, but the Karganeth are just... They're T3, right? They're going to shred through those T2 ridiculously easily. Commander even goes down over here. That's the Powder Blue Commander for uh, Sha Sha Shabama Lamabad. Sha Shabama Lamabad. Uh, Bam is trying to blast down the Cerberus Cannon right here. It's getting repairs, but it will be blasted down eventually. Spybot connects with... You know, neither of those. One of them dies, so we won't have to deal with that. So far, the Karganeth seem to have found more value. Granted, it's only been a single advanced geothermal, but it's value nonetheless. Really, the Tiger Tanks stealing the show here. Powder Blue Commander throwing in the towel here. Couple of Scorpion turrets. Yeah, going to be enough to dissuade those tanks from moving forward at the very least. Once we get a few more up and running, or once we get the Tsar out there, the Tsar also has enough uh, enough range technically to outrange the Scorpion turrets. If you use the splash damage, you can actually outrange them. Barely, but barely is all it takes. I think there was a tactical missile launcher over here somewhere. Yeah, a couple of tactical missile launchers that helped break the line on the front here. Vanguard looking to step forward, trying to find that value. We need to start firing away at this Persecutor Cannon. Do we have any vision of that? It looks like we definitely do not. Yeah, the blue commander needs to address this uh, static defense area over here. We have the unit for it. We just don't have the vision. That's why intel gathering is so important in this game. Without it, we are nothing. Just my angle right here. As we take a look at this front line, I want to grab that. That's a nice little. That's a nice little clip right there. Look at those starlights in the background with the Razorbacks and the Frontline T3 lab, all of which pumping out glorious, glorious firepower. Beautiful stuff right there from the Yellow Commander. Also, of course, lovely that we're moving production away from the backline. So, if the backline goes down, at the very least, the production doesn't go down. If the production goes down, of course, the backline doesn't go down. It means that you, uh, you you set yourself up with a little bit of a safeguard here. You can risk it all and keep the build power all centralized, but, of course, easier to, uh, easier, easier to not lose it all. Phantom Amphibious Stealth Scout over here. It's just a scout. It has no attack. It has no anything. It just has a cloak field on it, so it's it's impossible to detect without a tick or some such other running right into it. It doesn't even have an EMP either. It has a... You can see the self-destruct radius is nothing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great... It's, a, it's the perfect scout, but it doesn't have much more utility after that. That does mean we have the uh, extra Cortex units enabled, which is very cool to see. I think the I think it's mostly Cortex vehicles. Here we go. Yeah, we can see the Siege Breaker available as well as the Phantom. I don't know if these got pushed to base game or not. We could flash the changes real quick here. It was a little bit of a battle. We'll take a look at that in a second here after we see how this goes. Uh, Sheldon trying their best to clean all this up. Those are heavy tanks though, and they're uh, well, to say the least, they're quite heavy. Difficult to kill. Mammoth lending a lot of sturdiness here. That uh, flag truck doing a great job of shooting down those wasps. But, of course, once it goes down, those wasps are going to be the king of the skies. And this gets cleaned up quite nicely. Okay, changes really quick. Uh, something, something, something. Doesn't look like it. <laughs> okay, so we were just playing We were just playing with some uh, different settings here. Nuclear bombers coming in on the, on the uh, green base on the northern side here. It looks like those bombers will be uncontested, too. We have fighters trying desperately to clean all this up, but there's nowhere near enough fighters to save this in the bomber drops its payload. Boom! Goes the base of the Lavender Commander in the back line. Just about to get that T3 lab up and running, but no longer will that production continue. Razorbacks swarming through the southern side as well here, finding a wonderful opportunity path. Blasting down to the T2 lab, popping the geothermals here imminently. Sometimes all it takes is the right pressure and the right angle, and just like that, just like that, the entire back line, well, the entire front line, really, of the blue, of the blue team has been completely destroyed. Saving up those Razorbacks feels bad because you're putting so much metal on them, but if it wins you the game at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. At this point, the red team pulling ahead exponentially with 200% economy benefit. They're going to be running away with the lead here very quickly. Mammoth's trying to blast down whatever they can. I love this scout right here. This scout providing a lot of valuable intelligence as to where the enemy enemy bases are, allowing those nuclear bombers to go in and bomb the precise targets. Uh, 
Now it's a matter of finishing this game. Yeah. The red team needing only to send their forces forward. This is a this is a done deal right now. The red team with a single commander. And just like that, he throws in the towel. Vote passes for the resign. And the red team with an overwhelming pressure on the southern side and an eventual push with some nuclear bombing to spice things up ever so slightly. He manages to win the game. and be a bit, Well, this game of Beyond All Reason. Not the game ever of Beyond All Reason. I'm sure these players will be back to lose in another match sometime later down the line. So don't forget to subscribe because I probably will cast that game just as well. Thanks a ton for watching, everybody. I sure hope you enjoyed. I sure hope you uh, will leave a comment down below what you appreciated about this match or let me know if you caught anything that I missed. And I hope to see you in the very next game of Beyond All Reason. Peace out, everybody, and have a great rest of your day.